Chapter Sixteen of The Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Leviatt takes a step. Miss Radford was sitting on the flat rock on the hill where she had written the first page of her novel. The afternoon sun was coming slantwise over the western mountains, sinking steadily toward the rift out of which came the rose veil that she had watched many times. She had just completed a paragraph in which the villain appears when she became aware of someone standing near. She turned swiftly, with heightened color, to see Leviatt. His sudden appearance gave her something of a shock, for, as he stood there, smiling at her, he answered perfectly the description she had just written. He might have just stepped from one of her pages, but the shock passed, leaving her a little pale, but quite composed, and not a little annoyed. She had found her work interesting. She had become quite absorbed in it. Therefore, she failed to appreciate Leviatt's sudden appearance, and, with upturned chin, turned from him and pretended an interest in the rim of hills that surrounded the flat. For an instant, Leviatt stood, a frown wrinkling his forehead. Then, with a smile, he stepped forward and seated himself beside her on the rock. She immediately drew her skirts close to her and shot a displeased glance at him from the corners of her eyes. Then, seeing that he still sat there, she moved her belongings a few feet and followed them. He could not doubt the significance of the move, but had he been wise, he might have ignored it. A woman's impulses will move her to rebuke a man, but if he will accept without comment, he may be reasonably sure of her pity, and pity is a path of promise. But the range boss neglected his opportunity. He made the mistake of thinking that because he had seen her many times while visiting her brother, he might now, with propriety, assume an air of intimacy toward her. I reckon this rock is plenty big enough for both of us, he said amiably. She measured the distance between them with a calculating eye. It is, she returned quietly, if you remain exactly where you are. He forced a smile. And if I don't, he inquired. You may have the rock to yourself, she returned coldly. I did not ask you to come here. He chose to ignore this hint, telling her that he had been to the cabin to see Ben, and finding him absent, had ridden through the flat. I saw you when I was quite a piece away, he concluded, and thought maybe you might be lonesome. When I am lonesome, I choose my own company, she returned coldly. Why, sure, he said, his tone slightly sarcastic. You certainly ought to know who you want to talk to. But you ain't objecting to me setting on this hill, he inquired. The hill is not mine she observed quietly, examining one of the written pages of her novel. Sit here as long as you like. Thanks, he drawled the word. Leaning back on one elbow, he stretched out as though assured that she would make no further objections to his presence. She ignored him completely, and very deliberately arranged her papers and resumed writing. For a time he lay silent, watching the pencil travel the width of the page, and then back. A mass of completed manuscript lay at her side, the pages covered with carefully written, legible words. She had always taken a pardonable pride in her penmanship. For a while he watched her, puzzled, furtively trying to decipher some of the words that appeared upon the pages. But the distance was too great for him, and he finally gave it up and fell to looking at her instead, though determined to solve the wordy mystery that was amassed near her. Finally, finding the silence irksome, he dropped an experimental word, speaking casually. You must have been to school a heap, writing like you do. She gave him no answer, being at that moment absorbed in a thought which she was trying to transcribe before it should take wings and be gone forever. Writing comes easy to some people, he persisted. The thought had been set down. She turned very slightly. Yes, she said, looking steadily at him. It does. So does impertinence. He smiled easily. I ain't aiming to be impertinent, he returned. 
I wouldn't reckon on asking you what your writing would be impertinent. It's too long for a letter. It is a novel, she returned shortly. He smiled, exulting over the partial concession. I reckon to write a book you must be some special kind of woman, he observed admiringly. She was silent. He sat up and leaned toward her, his eyes flashing with a sudden passion. If that's it, he said with unmistakable significance. I don't mind telling you that I'm some partial to them special kind. Her chin rose a little. I'm not concerned over your feelings, she returned without looking at him. That kind of woman would naturally know a heap, he went on, apparently unmindful of the rebuke. They'd certainly know enough to be able to see when a man likes them. She evidently understood the drift for her eyes glowed subtly. It is too bad that you are not a special kind of man, then, she replied. Meaning? he questioned, his eyes glinting with eagerness. Meaning that if you were a special kind of man, you would be able to tell when a woman doesn't like you, she said coldly. I reckon I ain't a special kind, then, he declared, his face reddening slightly. Of course I seen that you ain't appeared to take much of a shine to me. But I heard that there's women that can be won if a man keeps at it long enough. Some men like to waste their time, she returned quietly. I don't call it wasting time to be talking to you, he declared rapidly. Our opinions differ, she observed shortly, resting the pencil point on the page that she had been writing. Her profile was toward him. Her cheeks were tinged with color. Some stray wisps of hair hung, breeze-blown, over her forehead and temples. She made an attractive picture, sitting there with the soft sunlight about her, a picture whose beauty smote Leviatt's heart with a pang of sudden regret and disappointment. She might have been his, but for the coming of Ferguson. And now, because of the stray man's wiles, he was losing her. A sudden rage seized upon him. He leaned forward, his face bloating poisonously. Maybe I could name a man who ain't wasting his time, he sneered. She turned suddenly and looked at him, dropping pencil and paper, her eyes flashing with a bitter scorn. You are one of those sulking cowards who fawn over men and insult defenseless women, she declared the words coming slowly and distinctly. He had realized before she had answered that he had erred, and he smiled deprecatingly, the effort contorting his face. I wasn't meaning just that, he said weakly. I reckon it's a clear field and no favors. He took a step toward her, his voice growing tense. I've been coming down to your cabin a lot, saying I was coming to see Ben. Well, I didn't come to see Ben. I wanted to look at you. I reckon you'd know that. A woman can't help but see when a man's in love with her. Well, you never give me a chance to tell you. I'm telling you now. I want you to marry me. I'm range boss for the two diamond, and I got some stock of my own, and money in the bank over in Cimarron. I put up a shack a few miles down the river and... Stop, commanded Miss Radford imperiously. Leviatt had been speaking rapidly, absorbed in his subject, assurance shining in his face. But, at Miss Radford's command, he broke off suddenly and stiffened, surprise widening his eyes. You have said enough, she continued. Quite enough. I have never thought of you as a possible admirer. I certainly have done nothing that might lead you to believe I would marry you. I do not even like you, not even respect you. I'm not certain that I shall ever marry, but if I do, I certainly shall not marry a man whose every look is an insult. She turned haughtily and began to gather up her papers. There had been no excitement in her manner. Her voice had been steady, even, and tempered with a slight scorn. For a brief space, Leviatt stood while the full significance of her refusal ate slowly into his consciousness. Whatever hopes he might have had, 
had been swept away in those few short, pithy sentences. His passion checked, the structure erected by his imagination toppled to ruin, his vanity hurt. He stood before her, stripped of the veneer that had made him seem, heretofore, nearly the man he professed to be. In her notebook she had written, Dave Leviatt. One rather gets the impression that the stoop is a reflection of the man's nature, which seems vindictive and suggests a low cunning. His eyes are small, deep-set, and glitter when he talks, but they are steady and cold, almost merciless. One's thoughts go instantly to the tiger. I shall try to create that impression in the reader's mind. And now, as she looked at him, she was sure that task would not be difficult. She had now an impression of him that seemed as though it had been seared into her mind. The eyes that she had thought merciless were now glittering malevolently, and she shuddered at the satiric upward curve of his lips as he stepped close to the rock and placed a hand upon the mass of manuscript lying there that she had previously dropped to prevent her leaving. "'So you don't love me,' he sneered. "'You don't even respect me. Why? "'Cause you're taking a shine to that damn maverick "'that come here from Dry Bottom? "'Stafford's new stray man? "'That is my business,' she returned icily. "'It sure is,' he said, "'the words writhing venomously through his lips. "'And it's my business, too. "'There ain't any damned... "'He had glanced suddenly downward while he had been talking.' and his gaze rested upon an upturned page of the manuscript that lay beside him on the rock. He broke off speaking and, reaching down, took up the page, his eyes narrowing with interest. The page he had taken up was one from the first chapter and described in detail the shooting match in Dry Bottom. It was a truthful picture of what had actually happened. She had even used the real names of the characters. Leviatt saw a reference to the Silver Dollar Saloon, to the loungers, to the stranger who had ridden up and who sat on his pony near the hitching rail, and who was called Ferguson. He saw his own name, read the story of how the stranger had eclipsed his feet by putting six bullets into the can. He dropped the page to the rock and looked up at Miss Radford with a short laugh. So that's what you're writing he sneered. You're writing something that really happened. You're even writing the real names and telling how Stafford's stray man butted in and beat me shooting. You know and this shows that you and him has been traveling pretty close together. For an instant Miss Radford forgot her anger. Her eyes snapped with a sudden interest. Were you the man who hit the can five times? she questioned, unable to conceal her eagerness. She saw a flush slowly mount to his face. Evidently he had said more than he had intended. "'Well, if I am,' he returned, his lips writhing in a sneer. "'Him beating me shooting that way don't prove nothing.' She was now becoming convinced of her cleverness. From Ben's description of the man who had won the shooting match— she had been able to lead Ferguson to the admission that he had been the central character in that incident. And now it had transpired that Leviatt was the man he had beaten. This had been the way she had written it in the story. So far the plot that had been born of her imagination had proved to be the story of a real occurrence. She had counted upon none but imaginary characters, though she had determined to clothe these with reality through study. But now, she had discovered, she had been the chronicler of a real incident, and two of her characters had been pitted against each other in a contest in which there had been enough bitterness to provide the animus necessary to carry them through succeeding pages, ready and willing to fly at each other's throats. She was not able to conceal her satisfaction over the discovery, and when she looked at Leviatt again, she smiled broadly. That confession explains a great many things, she said, stooping to recover the page that he had dropped beside her upon the rock. Meaning what? he questioned, his eyes glittering evilly. 
meaning that I now know why you are not friendly toward Mr. Ferguson, she returned. I heard that he beat you in the shooting match, she went on tauntingly, and then when you insulted him afterwards, he talked very plainly to you. The moment she had spoken, she realized that her words had hurt him, for he paled and his eyes narrowed venomously, but his voice was cold and steady. Was Mr. Ferguson telling you that? he inquired, succeeding in placing ironic emphasis upon the prefix. She was arranging the contents of her handbag, and she did not look up as she answered him. That is my business, she returned quietly. But I don't mind telling you that the man who told me about the occurrence would not lie about it. It's nice that you got such a heap of faith in him, he sneered. It was plain to her that he thought Ferguson had told her about the shooting match, and it was equally plain that he still harbored evil thoughts against the stray man. And also, he suspected that something more than mere friendship existed between her and Ferguson. She had long hoped that one day she might be given that opportunity of meeting in person a man whose soul was consumed with jealousy in order that she might be able to gain some impressions of the intensity of his passion. This seemed to be her opportunity. Therefore, she raised her chin a little and looked at him with a tantalizing smile. Of course I have faith in him, she declared with a slight biting emphasis. I believe in him, absolutely. She saw his lips twitch. Sure, he sneered. You was just beginning to believe in him that day when you was holding hands with him. Just about here. I reckon he was enjoying himself. She started, but smiled immediately. So you saw that? She inquired, knowing that he had, but taking a keen delight in seeing that he still remembered. But this conversation was becoming too personal. She had no desire to argue this point with him even to get an impression of the depth of his passion. So she gathered up her belongings and prepared to depart. But he stepped deliberately in front of her, barring the way of escape. His face was aflame with passion. I seen him holding your hand, he said, his voice trembling. I seen that he was holding it longer than he had any right. And I seen you pull your hand away when you thought I was looking at you. I reckon you've taken a shine to him. He's a kind that the women like, with his slick ways and smooth palaver and his love-making. He laughed with his lips only, his eyes narrowed to glittering pinpoints. She had not thought that jealousy could make a person half so repulsive. If you're loving him, he continued, leaning toward her, his muscles tense, his lips quivering with a passion that he was no longer able to repress. I'm telling you that you're wasting your time. You wouldn't think so much of him if you know that he'd come here. Leviatt had become aware that Miss Radford was not listening, that she was no longer looking at him, but at something behind him. At the instant he became aware of this, he turned sharply in his tracks, his right hand falling swiftly to his holster. Not over a half dozen paces distant stood Ben Radford, gravely watching. Maybe you folks was rehearsing a scene from that story, he observed quietly. I wasn't intending to interrupt, but I heard loud talking and I thought maybe it wasn't anything private. So I just climbed off my horse and climbed up here to satisfy my curiosity. Levy's hand fell away from the holster, a guilty grin overspreading his face. I reckon we wasn't rehearsing any scene, he said, trying to make the words come easily. I was just telling your sister that... Miss Radford laughed banteringly. You have spoiled a chapter in my book, Ben, she declared with pretended annoyance. Mr. Leviatt had just finished proposing to me, and was at the point where he was supposed to speak bitter words about his rival. She laughed again gazing at Leviatt with mocking eyes. Of course, I shall never be able to tell my readers what he might have said, for you appeared at a most inopportune time. But he has taught me a great deal, much more, in fact, than I ever expected from him. 
She bowed mockingly. I am very, very much obliged to you, Mr. Leviatt, she said, placing broad emphasis upon her words. I promise to try and make a very interesting character of you. There were times when you were most dramatic. She bowed to Leviatt and flashed a dazzling smile at her brother. Then she walked past Leviatt, picked her way daintily over the loose stones on the hillside, and descended to the level where she had tethered her pony. Ben stood grinning admiringly after her as she mounted and rode out into the flat. Then he turned to Leviatt, soberly contemplating him. I don't think you were rehearsing for the book, he said quietly, an undercurrent of humor in his voice. She was fun in me, returned Leviatt, his face reddening. I reckon she was, returned Ben dryly. She's certainly some clever at handing it to a man. He smiled down into the flat, where Miss Radford could still be seen riding toward the cabin. Looks as though she wasn't quite ready to change her name to Leviatt, he grinned. But there was no humor in Leviatt's reflections. He stood for a moment looking down into the flat, the expression of his face morose and sullen. Ben's bantering words only added fuel to the flame of rage and disappointment that was burning fiercely in his heart. Presently, the hard lines of his lips disappeared, and he smiled craftily. She's about ready to change her name, he said. Only she ain't figuring that it's going to be Leviatt. You're guessing now, returned Ben sharply. Leviatt laughed oddly. I reckon I ain't doing any guessing he returned. You've been around her a heap and been seeing her considerable. But you ain't been using your eyes. Meaning what? demanded Ben, an acid-like coldness in his voice. Meaning that if you'd been using your eyes, you'd a seen she's some took up with Stafford's new stray man. Well, returned Ben, she's her own boss. If she's made friends with Ferguson, that's her business, he laughed. She's certainly clever, he added, and maybe she's got her own notion as to why she's made friends with him. She's told me that she's going to make him a character in the book she's writing. Likely she's stringing him. I reckon she ain't stringing him, declared Leviatt. A girl ain't doing much stringing when she's holding a man's hand and blushing when somebody catches her at it. There was a slight sneer in Leviatt's voice, which drew a sharp glance from Radford. For an instant his face clouded, and he was about to make a sharp reply. But his face cleared immediately, and he smiled. I'm banking on her being able to take care of herself, he returned. Her holding Ferguson's hand proves nothing. Likely she was trying to get an impression. She's always telling me that. But she's running her own game, and if she's stringing Ferguson, that's her business. And if she thinks a good bit of him, that's her business, too. If a man ain't jealous, he might be able to see that Ferguson ain't a half-bad sort of man. An evil light leaped into Leviatt's eyes. He turned and faced Radford, words coming from his lips coldly and incisively. When you interrupted me, he said, I was going to tell your sister about Ferguson. Maybe if I tell you what I was going to tell her, it'll make you see things some different. A while ago, Stafford was wanting to hire a gunfighter. He shot a significant glance at Radford, who returned it steadily. I reckon you know what he wanted a gunfighter for. He got one. His name's Ferguson. He's getting a hundred dollars a month for the season to put Ben Radford out of business. The smile had gone from Radford's face. His lips were tightly closed, his eyes cold and alert. You lying about Ferguson because you think he's friendly with Mary? He questioned quietly. Leviatt's right hand dropped swiftly to his holster. But Radford laughed harshly. Quit it, he said sharply. I ain't saying you're a liar. But what you said makes you liable to be called that until you prove he ain't. How do you know Ferguson's been hired to put me out of business? Leviatt laughed. Stafford and me went to Dry Bottom to get a gunfighter. 
I shot a can in the street in front of the Silver Dollar so Stafford would be able to get a line on anybody trying to beat my game. Ferguson done it, and Stafford hired him. Radford's gaze was level and steady. Then you've knowed right along, and he was looking for me, he said coldly. Why didn't you say something about it before? You've been claiming to be my friend. Leviatt flushed, shifting uneasily from one foot to the other, but watching Radford with alert and suspicious glances. Why, he returned shortly, I'm range boss for the two diamond, and I ain't hired to tell what I know. I reckon you'd think I was a hell of a man to be telling things that I ain't got no right to tell. But you're telling it now, returned Radford, his eyes narrowing a little. Yes, returned Leviatt quietly. I am, and you're calling me a liar for it. But I'm telling you to wait. Maybe you'll tumble. I reckon you ain't heard how Ferguson's been telling the boys that he went down to your cabin one night, claiming to have been bit by a rattler. "'cause he wanted to get acquainted with you "'and pot you some day when you wasn't expecting it. "'And then, after he stayed all night in your cabin, "'he was bragging to the boys "'that he reckoned on making a fool of your sister. "'Oh, he's some slick,' he concluded, "'a note of triumph in his voice. "'Radford started, his face paling a little. "'He thought it strange that an experienced plainsman, "'as Ferguson appeared to be, should have been bitten by a rattler in the manner he had described. And then he had been hanging around the... Maybe you might think it's unusual for Stafford to hire a two-gun man to look after strays, broke in Levitt at this point. Two-gun men ain't taking such jobs regular, he insinuated. Stray men as usual low-down, mean, ornery cusses which ain't much good for anything else and so they spend their time moping round doing work that ain't fit for any puncher to do. Radford had snapped himself erect, his lips straightening. He suddenly held out a hand to Leviatt. I'm thanking you, he said steadily. It's rather late for you to be telling me, but I think it's come in time anyway. I'm watching for a little while, and if things are as you say... He broke off, his voice filled with a significant grimness. So long, he added. He turned and descended the slope of the hill. An instant later, Leviatt saw him loping his pony toward the cabin. For a few minutes, Leviatt gazed after him, his eyes alight with satisfaction. Then he, too, descended the slope of the hill and mounted his pony. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of the Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. A Break in the Story. Mary Radford had found the day too beautiful to remain indoors, and so directly after dinner she had caught up her pony and was off for a ride through the cottonwood. She had been compelled to catch up the pony herself, for of late Ben had been neglectful of his duty. Until the last week or so, he had always caught her pony and placed the saddle on it before leaving in the morning, assuring her that if she did not ride during his absence, the pony would not suffer through being saddled and bridled. But within the last week, she thought she detected a change in Ben's manner. He seemed preoccupied and glum, falling suddenly into a taciturnity, broken only by brief periods, during which he condescended to reply to her questions with it seemed, grudging monosyllables. Several times, too, she had caught him watching her with furtive glances, in which she imagined she detected a glint of speculation. But of this she was not quite sure, for when she bluntly questioned him concerning his moods, he had invariably given her an evasive reply. Fearing that there might have been a recurrence of the old trouble with the two-diamond manager, about which he had told her during her first days at the cabin, she ventured a question. He had grimly assured her that he anticipated no further trouble in that direction. So, unable to get a direct reply from him, she had decided that, perhaps, he would speak when the time came, and so she had ceased questioning. In spite of his negligence regarding the pony, she had not given up her rides, nor had she neglected to give a part of each morning to the story. 
The work of gradually developing her hero's character had been an absorbing task. Times when she lingered over the pages of the story, she found herself wondering whether she had sounded the depths of his nature. She knew, at least, that she had made him attractive, for as he moved among her pages, she, who should have been satiated with him because of being compelled to record his every word and movement, found his magnetic personality drawing her applause, found that he haunted her dreams, discovered one day that her waking moments were filled with thoughts of him. But of late she had begun to suspect that her interest in him was not all on account of the story. There were times when she sat long thinking of him, seeing him, watching the lights and shadows of expression come and go in his face. Somewhere between the real Ferguson and the man who was impersonating him in her story was an invisible line that she could not trace. There were times when she could not have told whether the character she admired belonged to the real or the unreal. She was thinking much of this today while she rode into the subdued light of the cottonwood. Was she absorbed in the task of putting a real character in her story, to confess that her interest in him was not wholly the interest of the artist who sees the beauties and virtues of a model only long enough to paint them into the picture? The blushes came when she suddenly realized that her interest was not wholly professional, that she had lately lingered long over her model, at times when she had not been thinking of the story at all. Then, too, she had considered her friends in the East, what would they say if they knew of her friendship with the two-diamond stray man? The standards of Eastern civilization were not elastic enough to include the man whom she had come to know so well, who had strode as boldly into her life as he had strode into her story, with his steady, serene eyes, his picturesque rigging, and his two guns, their holsters tied so suggestively and forebodingly down. Would her friends be able to see the romance in him? Would they be able to estimate him according to the standards of the world in which he lived, in which he moved so gracefully? She was aware that, measured by Eastern standards, Ferguson fell far short of the average in those things that combined to produce the polished gentleman. Yet she was also aware that these things were mere accomplishments, a veneer acquired through constant practice, and that usually the person known as gentleman could not be distinguished by these things at all, that the real gentleman could be known only through the measure of his quiet and genuine consideration and unfailing Christian virtues. As she rode through the cottonwood into that deep solitude which brings with it a mighty reverence for nature and a solemn desire for communion with the soul, that solitude in which all affectation disappears, and man is face to face with his maker, she tried to think of Ferguson in an eastern drawing room, attempting a sham courtesy, affecting mannerisms that more than once had brought her own soul into rebellion. But she could not get him into the imaginary picture. He did not belong there. It seemed that she was trying to force a living figure into a company of mechanical puppets. And so they were, puppets who answered to the pulling strings of precedent and established convention. But at the same time, she knew that this society, which she affected to despise, would refuse to accept him, that if by any chance he should be given a place in it, he would be an object of ridicule, or at the least passive contempt. The world did not want originality, would not welcome in its drawing room, the free, unaffected child of nature. No, the world wanted pretense, imitation. It frowned upon truth and applauded the sycophant. She was not even certain that if she succeeded in making Ferguson a real living character, the world would be interested in him. But she had reached that state of mind in which she cared very little about the world's opinion. She, at least, was interested in him. Upon the same afternoon, for there is no rule for the mere incidents of life, Ferguson loped his pony through the shade of the cottonwood. He was going to visit the cabin in Bear Flat. Would she be home? Would she be glad to see him? He could not bring his mind to give him an affirmative answer to either of these questions. But of one thing he was certain. 
she had treated him differently from the other two diamond men who had attempted to win her friendship was he to think then that she cared very little whether he came to the cabin or not he smiled over his pony's mane at the thought he could not help but see that she enjoyed his visits when he rode up to the cabin he found it deserted but with a smile he remounted mustard and set out over the river trail through the cottonwood he was sure that he would find her on the hill in the flat and when he reached the edge of the cottonwood opposite the hill he saw her when she heard the clatter of his pony's hoofs she turned and saw him waving a hand at him i reckoned on finding you here he said when he came close enough to be heard she shyly made room for him beside her on the rock but there was mischief in her eye it seems impossible to hide from you she said with a pretense of annoyance he laughed as he came around the edge of the rock and sat near her was you really trying to hide he questioned cause if you was he continued you hadn't ought to have got up on this hill where i could see you without even looking for you but of course you were not looking for me she observed quietly he caught her gaze and held it steadily i reckon i was looking for you he said why why suddenly fearful that something had happened to ben is anything wrong he smiled nothing's wrong he returned but i wanted to talk to you and i expected to find you here there was a gentleness in his voice that she had not heard before and a quiet significance to his words that made her eyes droop away from his with slight confusion she replied without looking at him but i came here to write she said he gravely considered her drawing one foot up on the rock and clasping his hands about his knee i thought a lot about that book he declared with a trace of embarrassment since you told me that you was going to put real men and women in it i expect you made them do the things you wanted them to do and made them say what you wanted them to say that part is right and proper there wouldn't be any sense of anyone writing a book unless they could put into it what they thought was right but what's been bothering me is this how can you tell whether the things you made them say is what they would have said if they had any chance to talk and how can you tell what their feelings would be when you set them doing something she laughed that is a prerogative which the writer assumes without question she returned the author of a novel makes his characters think and act as the author himself imagines he would act in the same circumstances he looked at her with amused eyes that's just what i was trying to get at he said you put me into your book and and you made me do and say things out of your mind but you don't know for sure whether i would have done and said things just like you have wrote em maybe if i would have had something to say i wouldn't have done things your way at all i'm sure you would she returned positively well now he returned smiling you're speaking as though you was pretty certain about it you must have wrote a whole lot of the story it is two-thirds finished she returned with a trace of satisfaction in her voice which did not escape him and you got all your characters doing and thinking things that you think they ought to do his eyes gleamed craftily you got a man and a girl in it of course and they're going to love one another no other outcome is popular with novel readers she returned he rocked back and forth his eyes languidly surveying the rim of hills in the distance i expect that outcome is popular in real life too he observed nobody ever hears about it when it turns out some other way i expect love is always a popular subject she returned smiling his eyes were still languid his gaze still on the rim of the distant hills you got any love talk in there between the man and the girl he questioned of course that's mighty interesting he returned i expect they do a good bit of mushing 
They do not talk extravagantly, she defended. Then I expect it must be pretty good, he returned. I don't like mushy love stories. And now he turned and looked fairly at her. Of course, he said slyly, I don't know whether it's necessary or not, but I've been thinking that to write a good love story, the writer ought to be in love. Whoever was writing would know more about how it feels to be in love. She admired the cleverness with which he had led her up to this point. But she was not to be trapped. She met his eyes fairly. I'm sure it's not necessary for the writer to be in love, she said quietly, but positively. I flatter myself that my love scenes are rather real, and I have not found it necessary to love anyone. This reply crippled him instantly. Well, now, he said, eyeing her, she thought, a bit reproachfully. That comes pretty near stumping me. But he added, a subtle expression coming again into his eyes. You say you've got only two-thirds finished. Maybe you'll be in love before you get it all done. And then maybe you'll find that you didn't get it right and have to do it all over again. That would sure be too bad, when you could have got in love and wrote it real in the first place. I don't think I shall fall in love, she said, laughing. He looked quickly at her suddenly grave. I wouldn't want to think you meant that, he said. Why? she questioned in a low voice, her laughter subdued by his earnestness. Why? he said steadily, as though stating a perfectly plain fact. I thought right along that you liked me. Of course I ain't been fool enough to think that you love me. And now he reddened a little. But I don't deny that I've Hope that you would. Oh, dear, she laughed. And so you have planned it all out. And I was hoping that you would not prove so deep as that. You know, she went on, you promised me a long while ago that you would not fall in love with me. I don't reckon that I said that, he returned. I told you I wasn't going to get fresh. I reckon I ain't fresh now. But I expect I couldn't help loving you. I've done that since the first day. She could not stop the blushes. They would come. And so would that thrilling, breathless exultation. No man had ever talked to her like this. No man had ever made her feel quite as she felt at this moment. She turned a crimson face to him. But you haven't any right to love me, she declared, feeling sure... She had been unable to make him understand that she meant to rebuke him. Evidently, he did not understand that she meant to do that, for he unclasped his hand from his knee and came closer to her, standing at the edge of the rock, one hand resting upon it. Of course I didn't have any right, he said gravely, but I loved you just the same. There's been some things in my life that I couldn't help doing. Loving you is one. I expect that you'll think I'm pretty fresh, but I've been thinking a whole lot about you, and I got to tell you, you ain't like the women I've been used to, and I reckon I ain't just the kind of man you've been acquainted with all your life. You've been used to seeing men who was all slicked up and clever. I expect them kind of men appeal to any woman. I ain't claiming to be none of them clever kind. But I've been around quite a little, and I ain't never done anything that I'm ashamed of. I can't offer you a heap, but if you... She had looked up quickly, her cheeks burning. Please don't, she pleaded, rising and placing a hand on his arm, gripping it tightly. I have known for a long time, but I... I wanted to be sure... He could not suspect that she had only just now begun to realize that she was in danger of yielding to him, and that the knowledge frightened her. "'You wanted to be sure?' he questioned, his face clouding. "'What is it you wanted to be sure of?' "'Why,' she returned, laughing to hide her embarrassment, "'I wanted to be sure that you loved me.' 
Well, you can be sure now, he said. I believe I can, she laughed. And, she continued, finding it difficult to pretend seriousness, knowing what I do will make writing so much easier. His face clouded again. I don't see what your writing has got to do with it, he said. You don't? she demanded, her eyes widening with pretended surprise. Why, don't you see that I wanted to be sure of your love so that I might be able to portray a real love scene in my story? He did not reply instantly, but folded his arms over his chest and stood looking at her. In his expression was much reproach and not a little disappointment. The hopes that had filled his dreams had been ruined by her frivolous words. He saw her at this moment, a woman who had trifled with him, who had led him cleverly on to a declaration of love that she might, in the end, sacrifice him to her art. But in this moment, when he might have been excused for exhibiting anger, for heaping upon her the bitter reproaches of an outraged confidence, he was supremely calm. The color fled from his face, leaving it slightly pale, and his eyes swam with a deep feeling that told of the struggle that he was making. I didn't think you'd do it, ma'am, he said finally, a little hoarsely. But I reckon you know your own business best. He smiled slightly. I don't think there's any use of you and me meeting again. I don't want to be going on, being a dummy man that you can watch. But I'm glad to have amused you some, and I have enjoyed myself talking to you. But I reckon you've done what you wanted to do, and so I'll be getting along. He smiled grimly, and with an effort turned and walked around the corner of the rock, intending to descend the hill and mount his pony. But as he passed around to the side of the rock, he heard her voice. Wait, please, she said in a scarcely audible voice. He halted, looking gravely at her from the opposite side of the rock. You wanting to get something more for your story? he asked. She turned and looked over her shoulder at him, her eyes luminous with a tell-tale expression, her face crimson. Why, she said, smiling at him, do you really think that I could be so mean? He was around the rock again and half a dozen steps and standing above her, his eyes alight, his lips parted slightly with surprise and eagerness. You mean that you're wanting to make sure that I loved you wasn't, wasn't all for the sake of the story? He demanded rapidly. Her eyes drooped away from his. Didn't you tell me that a writer should be in love in order to be able to write of it? She asked, her face averted. Yes. He was trembling a little and leaning toward her. In this position he caught her low reply. I think my love story will be real she returned. I have learned, but whatever she might have wanted to add was smothered when his arms closed tightly about her. A little later she drew a deep breath and looked up at him with moist, eloquent eyes. Perhaps I shall have to change the story a little, she said. He drew her head to his shoulder, one hand caressing her hair. If you do, he said, smiling. Don't have the hero thinking that the girl is making a fool of him. He drew her close. That certainly was a mighty bad minute you give me, he added. End of chapter 17、Chapter、18 of The Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. The Dim Trail A shadow fell upon the rock. Ferguson turned his head and looked toward the west, where the sun had already descended over the mountains. Why, it's sundown, he said, smiling into Miss Radford's eyes. I reckon the days must be getting shorter. The happy days are always short, she returned, blushing. He kissed her for this. For a while they sat, watching together the very colors swimming in the sky. 
They sat close together, saying little, for mere words are sometimes inadequate. In a little time the colors faded. The mountain peaks began to throw somber shades. Twilight, gray and cold, settled suddenly into the flat. Then Miss Radford raised her head from Ferguson's shoulder and sighed. "'Time to go home,' she said. "'Yes, time,' he returned. "'I'm riding down that far with you.' They rose and clambered down the hillside, and he helped her into the saddle. Then he mounted Mustard and rode across the flat beside her. Darkness had fallen when they rode through the clearing near the cabin and dismounted from their ponies at the door. The light from the kerosene lamp shone in a dim stream from the kitchen door, and within they saw dishes on the table with cold food. Ferguson stood beside his pony while Miss Radford went in and explored the cabin. She came to the door presently, shading her eyes to look out into the darkness. "'Ben has been here and gone,' she said. "'He can't be very far away. Won't you come in?' He laughed. "'I don't think I'll come in.' he returned. This lover business is new to me, and I wouldn't want Ben to come back and catch me blushing and take it on. But he has to know, she insisted, laughing. Sure, he said, secure in the darkness. But you tell him. I won't, she declared positively, stamping a foot. Then I reckon he won't get told, he returned quietly. Well, then she said, laughing. I suppose that is settled. She came out to the edge of the porch, away from the door, where the stream of light from within could not search them out, and there they took leave of one another, she going back into the cabin, and he mounting mustard and riding away in the darkness. He was in high spirits, for he had much to be thankful for. As he rode through the darkness, skirting the cottonwood in the flat, he allowed his thoughts to wander. His refusal to enter the cabin had not been a mere whim. He intended on the morrow to seek out Ben and tell him. He had not wanted to tell him with her looking on, to make the situation embarrassing for him. When he thought how she had fooled him by making it appear that she had led him on for the purpose of getting material for her love story, he was moved to silent mirth. But I certainly didn't see anything funny in it while she was putting it on he told himself as he rode. He had not ridden more than a quarter of a mile from the cabin and was passing a clump of heavy shrubbery when a man rose suddenly out of the shadows beside the trail. Startled, Mustard reared, and then seeing that the apparition was merely a man, he came quickly down and halted, shaking his head sagely. Ferguson's right hand had dropped swiftly to his right holster, but was raised again instantly as the man's voice came cold and steady. Get your hands up. Quick. Ferguson's hands were raised, but he gave no evidence of fear or excitement. Instead, he leaned forward, trying, in the dim light, to see the man's face. The latter still stood in the shadows, but now he advanced a little toward Ferguson, and the stray man caught his breath sharply. But when he spoke, his voice was steady. Why, it's Ben Radford, he said. That's just who it is returned Radford. I've been waiting for you. Well, that's right clever of you, returned Ferguson, drawing his words a little. He was puzzled over this unusual occurrence, but his face did not betray this. You was wanting to see me then, he added. You're keen, returned Radford, sneering slightly. Ferguson's face reddened. Well, I ain't no damn fool, he said sharply. And I don't like holding my hands up like this. I reckon whatever you're going to do, you ought to do right quick. I'm figuring to be quick, returned Radford shortly. Catch hold of your guns with the tips of one finger and one thumb and drop them. Don't hit any rocks and don't try any monkey business. He waited until Ferguson had dropped one gun, and then, knowing that the stray man usually wore two weapons, he continued sharply. I'm waiting for the other one. Ferguson laughed. And you'll be waiting a long time. There ain't any other one. Broke a spring yesterday and sent it over to Cimarron to get it fixed up. You can have it when it comes back, he added with a touch of sarcasm, if you're caring to wait that long. 
Radford did not reply, but came around to Ferguson's left side and peered at the holster. It was empty. Then he looked carefully at the stray man's waist for signs that a weapon might have been concealed between the waistband and the trousers in front. Then, apparently satisfied, he stepped back, his lips closed grimly. Get off your horse, he ordered. Ferguson laughed as he swung down. Anything to oblige your friend, he said mockingly. The two men were now not over a yard apart, and at Ferguson's word, Radford's face became inflamed with wrath. I don't think I'm a friend of yours, he sneered coldly. I ain't making friends with every damn sneak that crawls around the country aiming to shoot a man in the back. He raised his voice, bitter with sarcasm. You're thinking you're pretty slick, he said. That all you have to do in this country is hang around till you got a man where you want him and then bore him. But you've got to the end of your rope. You ain't going to shoot anyone around here. I'm giving you a chance to say what you got to say, and then I'm going to fill you full of lead and plant you over in the cottonwood, in a place where no one will ever be able to find you, not even Stafford. I'd have shot you off your horse when you come around the bend, he continued coldly. But I wanted you to know who was doing it, and that the man that did it knowed what you come here to do. He poised his pistol menacingly. You got anything to say? he inquired. Ferguson looked steadily from the muzzle of the poised weapon to Radford's frowning eyes. Then he smiled grimly. Someone's been talking, he said evenly. He calmly crossed his arms over his chest, the right hand slipping carelessly under the left side of his vest. Then he rocked slowly back and forth on his heels and toes. Someone's been telling you a pack of lies, he added. I reckon you wondered, if I was going to shoot you in the back, that I ain't done it long ago. You're admitting I've had some chance. Radford sneered. I ain't wondering why you ain't done it before, he said. Maybe it's because you're too white-livered. Maybe you thought you didn't see your chance. I ain't worried none about why you didn't do it. But you ain't going to get another chance. The weapon came to a foreboding level. Ferguson laughed grimly, but there was an ironic quality in his voice that caught Radford's ear. It seemed to Radford that the stray man knew that he was near death, and yet some particular phase of the situation appealed to his humor, grim though it was. It came out when the stray man spoke. You've been guessing just now about shooting people in the back, saying that I've been thinking of doing it. But I reckon you ain't thought a lot about the way you're intending to put me out of business. I was wondering if it made any difference, shooting a man in the back or shooting him when he ain't got any guns. I expect a man that's shot when he ain't got guns would be just as dead as a man that's shot in the back, wouldn't he? He laughed again, his eyes gleaming in the dim light. That's the reason I ain't scared a heap, he said. For what I know about you... You ain't the man to shoot another without giving him a chance. And you're giving me a chance to talk. I ain't gonna do any praying. I reckon that's right. Radford shifted his feet uneasily. He could not have told at that moment whether or not he had intended to murder Ferguson. He had waylaid him with that intention, utterly forgetful that by shooting the stray man, he would be committing the very crime which he had accused Ferguson of contemplating. The muzzle of his weapon drooped uncertainly. Talk quick, he said shortly. Ferguson grinned. I'm taking my time, he returned. There ain't any use of being in such an awful hurry. Time don't amount to much when a man is talking for his life. I ain't asking who told you what you said about me. I got a pretty clear idea who it was. I had to tell a man pretty plain that my age has got its growth. And I don't think that man has admired me much for being told. But if he wanted to have me put out of business, he's going to do the job himself. Ben Radford ain't doing it. While he had been talking, he had contrived to throw the left side of his vest open. And his right hand was exposed in the dim light, a heavy six-shooter gleaming forebodingly in it. His arms were still crossed, 
but as he talked he had turned a very little and now the muzzle of the weapon was at a level trained fairly upon radford's breast and then came ferguson's voice again quiet cold incisive if there's going to be any shooting ben there'll be two of us doing it don't be afraid you'll beat me to it and he stared grimly over the short space that separated them for a full minute neither man moved a muscle silence a premonitory silence fell over them as they stood each with a steady finger dragging uncertainly upon the trigger of his weapon an owl hooted in the cottonwood nearby other noises of the night reached their ears unaware of this crisis mustard grazed unconcernedly at a distance then radford's weapon wavered a little and dropped to his side this game is too certain he said ferguson laughed and his six-shooter disappeared as mysteriously as it had appeared i thought i'd be able to make you see the point he said it don't always pay to be in too much of a hurry to do a thing he continued gravely i reckon i prove that someone's been lying about me if i'd wanted to shoot you i could have done it quite a spell ago i had you covered just as soon as i crossed my arms you'd never knowed about it that i didn't shoot proves that whoever told you i was after you has been romancing he laughed and now i'm telling you another thing that i was going to tell you about tomorrow maybe you want to shoot me for that but if you do i expect you'll have a woman to fight me and mary has found that we're in one mind about a thing we're going to hook up into a double harness i reckon when i'm your brother-in-law you won't be so worried about shooting me radford's astonishment showed for a moment in his eyes as his gaze met the stray man's then they drooped guiltily well i'm a damn fool he said finally i might a knowed that mary wouldn't get a foul of any man who was thinking of doing dirt to me he suddenly extended a hand you shaken he said ferguson took the hand gripping it tightly neither man spoke then radford suddenly unclasped his hand and turned striding rapidly up the trail toward the cabin for a moment ferguson stood looking after him with narrowed friendly eyes then he walked to mustard threw the bridle rein over the pommel of the saddle mounted and was off at a rapid lope toward the two diamond end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the two gun man by charles alden seltzer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn The Shot in the Dark Now that Mary Radford had obtained experience for the love scene in her story, it might be expected that on returning to the cabin, she would get out her writing materials and attempt to transcribe the emotions that had beset her during the afternoon. But she did nothing of the kind. After Ferguson's departure, she removed her writing garments walked several times around the interior of the cabin, and for a long time studied her face in the looking-glass. Yes, she discovered the happiness shining out of the glass. Several times, standing before the glass, she attempted to keep the lines of her face in repose, and though she almost succeeded in doing this, she could not control her eyes. They simply would gleam with the light that seemed to say to her, you may deceive people by making a mask of your face, but the eyes are the windows of the soul, and through them people will see your secret. Ben hadn't eaten much, she decided, as she seated herself at the table, after pouring a cup of tea. Before she finished her meal, she had begun to wonder over his absence. It was not his custom to go away in the night. She thought he might have gone to the corral, or might even be engaged in some small task in the stable. So, after completing her meal, she rose and went to the door, looking out. There was no moon, only the starlight, but in this she was able to distinguish objects in the clearing, and if Ben had been working about anywhere, she must have noticed him. She returned to the table and sat there long, pondering. Then she rose, heated some water, and washed and dried the dishes. 
Then she swept the kitchen floor and tidied things up a bit, returning to the door when all was complete. Still no signs that Ben was anywhere in the vicinity. She opened the screen door and went out upon the porch, leaning against one of the slender posts. For a long time she stood thus, listening to the indescribable noises of the night. This was only the second time since she had been with Ben that he had left her alone at night, and a slight chill stole over her as she watched the dense shadows beyond the clearing, shadows that seemed suddenly dismal and foreboding. She had loved the silence, but now suddenly it too seemed too deep, too solemn to be real. She shuddered, and with some unaccountable impulse shrank back against the screen door, one hand upon it, ready to throw it open. In this position she stood for a few minutes, and then from somewhere in the flat came a slight sound, and then, after a short interval, another. She shrank back again, a sudden fear of chilling her, her hands clasped over her breast. "'Someone is shooting,' she said aloud. She waited long for a repetition of the sounds, but she did not hear them again. Tremblingly, she returned to the cabin and resumed her chair at the table, fighting against a growing presentiment that something had gone wrong with Ben. But she could not have told from what direction the sounds had come, and so it would have been folly for her to ride out to investigate. And so for an hour she sat at the table, cringing away from the silence, starting at intervals when her imagination tricked her into belief that sound had begun. And then presently she became aware that there was sound. In the vast silence beyond the cabin door, something had moved. She was on her feet instantly, her senses alert, her fear had left her. Her face was pale, but her lips closed grimly as she went to the rack behind the door and took down a rifle that Ben always kept there. Then she turned the lamp low and cautiously stepped to the door. A pony whinnied, standing with ears erect at the edge of the porch. In a crumpled heap on the ground lay a man. She caught her breath sharply, but in the next instant was out and bending over him. With a strength that seemed almost beyond her, she dragged the limp form to the door where the light from the lamp shone upon it. Ben, she said sharply, what has happened? She shook him slightly, calling again to him. Aroused, he opened his eyes, recognized her, and raised himself painfully upon one elbow, smiling weakly. It ain't anything, sis, he said creased in the back of the head knocked me cold maybe my shoulder too i ain't been able to lift my arm he smiled again grimly though wearily from the back too the damn sneak her eyes filled vengefully and she leaned closer to him her voice tense who ben who did it ferguson he said sharply and again, as his eyes closed, the damn sneak. She swayed dizzily and came very near dropping him to the porch floor. But no sound came from her. And presently, when the dizziness had passed, she dragged him to the door, propped it open with a chair, then dragged him on through the opening to the kitchen, and from there to one of the adjoining rooms. Then, with pale face and determined lips, she set about the work of taking care of Ben's wounds. The spot on the back of the head, she found, was a mere abrasion, as he had said. But his shoulder had been shattered. The bullet, she discovered, having passed clear through the fleshy part of the shoulder after breaking one of the smaller bones. Getting her scissors, she clipped away the hair from the back of his head and sponged the wound and bandaged it, convinced that, of itself, it was not dangerous. Then she undressed him, and, by the use of plenty of clear, cold water, a sponge, and some bandages, stopped the flow of blood in his shoulder, and placed him in a comfortable position. He had very little fever, but she moved rapidly around him, taking his temperature, administering sedatives when he showed signs of restlessness, 
hovering over him constantly until the dawn began to come. Soon after this, he went off into a peaceful sleep, and, almost exhausted with her efforts and the excitement, she threw herself upon the floor beside his bed, sacrificing her own comfort that she might be near to watch should he need her. It was late in the afternoon when Radford opened his eyes to look out through the door that connected his room with the kitchen and saw his sister busying herself with the dishes. His mind was clear, and he suffered very little pain. For a long time he lay, quietly watching her, while his thoughts went back to the meeting on the trail with Ferguson. Why hadn't he carried out his original intention of shooting the stray man down from ambush? He had doubted Leviatt's word, and had hesitated, wishing to give Ferguson the benefit of the doubt, and had received his reward in the shape of a bullet in the back, after practically making a peace pact with his intended victim. He presently became aware that his sister was standing near him, and he looked up and smiled at her. Then in an instant she was kneeling beside him, admonishing him to quietness, smoothing his forehead, giving delighted little gasps over his improved condition. But in spite of her evident cheerfulness, there was a suggestion of trouble swimming deep in her eyes. He could not help but see that she was making a brave attempt to hide her bitter disappointment over the turn things had taken. Therefore he was not surprised when, after she had attended to all his wants, she sank on her knees beside him. Ben, she said, trying to keep a quiver out of her voice, are you sure it was Ferguson who shot you? He patted her hand tenderly and sympathetically with his uninjured one. I'm sorry for you, Mary, he returned, but there ain't any doubt about it. Then he told her of the warning he had received from Leviatt, and when he saw her lips curl at the mention of the two diamond range boss's name, he smiled. I thought the same thing that you were thinking, Mary, he said, and I didn't want to shoot Ferguson, but as things have turned out, I wouldn't have been much wrong to have done it. She raised her head from the coverlet. Did you see him before he shot you? she questioned eagerly. Just a little before, he returned. I met him at the turn in the trail about half a mile from here. I made him get down off his horse and drop his guns. We had a talk, for I didn't want to shoot him until I was sure, and he talked so clever that I thought he was telling the truth. But he wasn't. He told her about Ferguson's concealed pistol, how they had stood face to face with death between them, concluding, By that time I decided not to shoot him, but he didn't have the nerve to pull the trigger when he was looking at me. He waited till I got on my horse and was riding away. Then he sneaked up behind. He saw her body shiver, and he caressed her hair slowly, telling her that he was sorry things had turned out so and promising her that, when he recovered, he would bring the two-diamond stray man to a strict accounting, providing the latter didn't leave the country before. But he saw that his words had given her little comfort, for when an hour or so later, when he dropped off to sleep, the last thing he saw was her seated at the table in the kitchen, her head bowed in her hands, crying softly. Poor little kid, he said, as sleep dimmed his eyes. It looks as though this will be the end of her story. End of chapter 19、Chapter 20 of The Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Love and a Rifle. Ferguson did not visit Miss Radford the next morning. He had seen Leviatt and Tucson depart from the ranch house, had observed the direction they took, and had followed them. For twenty miles he had kept them in sight, watching them with a stern patience that had brought its reward. They had ridden twenty miles straight down the river, when Ferguson, concealed behind a ridge, saw them suddenly disappear into a little basin. Then he rode around the ridge, circled the rim of hills that surrounded the basin, and, dismounting from his pony, crept through a scrub-oak thicket to a point where he could look directly down upon them. 
he was surprised into a subdued whistle. Below him in the basin was an adobe hut. He had been through this section of the country several times, but had never before stumbled upon the hut. This was not remarkable, for situated as it was in this little basin, hidden from sight by a serried line of hills and ridges among which no cowpuncher thought to travel, nor cared to, the cabin was as safe from prying eyes as it was possible for a human habitation to be. There was a small corral near the cabin, in which there were several steers, half a dozen cows, and perhaps twenty calves. As Ferguson's eyes took in the latter detail, they glittered with triumph. Not even the wildest stretch of the imagination could produce twenty calves from half a dozen cows. But Ferguson did not need this evidence to convince him that the men who occupied the cabin were rustlers. Honest men did not find it necessary to live in a basin in the hills where they were shut in from sight of the open country. Cattle thieves did not always find it necessary to do so, unless they were men like these, who had no herds of their own among which to conceal their ill-gotten beasts. He was convinced that these men were migratory thieves who operated upon the herds nearest them, remained until they had accumulated a considerable number of cattle, and then drove the entire lot to some favored friend, who was not averse to running the risk of detection, if through that risk he came into possession of easily earned money. There were two of the men, beside Leviatt and Tucson, tall, rangy, looking their part. Ferguson watched them for half an hour, and then, convinced that he would gain nothing more by remaining there, he stealthily backed down the hillside to where his pony stood, mounted, and rode toward the river. Late in the afternoon, he entered Bear Flat, urged his pony at a brisk pace across it, and just before sundown drew rein in front of the Radford cabin. He dismounted and stepped to the edge of the porch, a smile of anticipation on his lips. The noise of his arrival brought Mary Radford to the door. She came out upon the porch, and he saw that her face was pale and her lips firmly set. Apparently something had gone amiss with her, and he halted, looking at her questioningly. "'What's up?' he asked. "'You ought to know,' she returned quietly. "'I ain't good at guessing riddles,' he returned, grinning at her. "'There is no riddle.' she answered, still quietly. She came forward until she stood within two paces of him, her eyes meeting his squarely. "'When you left here last night, did you meet Ben on the trail?' she continued steadily. He started, reddening a little. "'Why, yes,' he returned, wondering if Ben had told her what had been said at that meeting. "'Was he telling you about it?' "'Yes,' she returned evenly. He has been telling me about it. That should be sufficient for you. I'm sorry that I ever met you. You should know why. If I were you, I should not lose any time in getting away from here. Her voice was listless, even flat, but there was a grim note in it that told she was keeping her composure with difficulty. He laughed, thinking that since he had made the new agreement with the two-diamond manager, he had nothing to fear. I reckon I ought to be scared, he returned. But I ain't, and I don't consider that I'm losing any time. Her lips curved sarcastically. You have said something like that before, she told him, her eyes glittering scornfully. You have a great deal of faith in your ability to fool people, but you have miscalculated this time. I know why you have come to the Two Diamond. I know what made you come over here so much. Of course, I am partly to blame. You have fooled me as you have fooled everyone. She stood suddenly erect, her eyes flashing. If you planned to kill my brother, why did you not have the manhood to meet him face to face? Ferguson flushed. Would it help his case to deny that he had thought of fooling her? That he never had any intention of shooting Ben? He thought not. Leviatt had poisoned her mind against him. He smiled grimly. "'Someone's been talking,' he said quietly. "'You'd be helping to make this case clear if you'd tell who it was.' "'Someone has talked,' 
she replied. Someone who knows. Why didn't you tell me that you came here to kill Ben? That you were hired by Stafford to do it? Why, I didn't, ma'am, he protested, his face paling. You did, she stamped one foot vehemently. Ferguson's eyes drooped. I came here to see if Ben was rustling cattle, ma'am, he confessed frankly. But I wasn't intending to shoot him. Well, I've had lots of chances, and I didn't do it. Ain't that proof enough? No, she returned, her voice thrilling with a sudden bitter irony. You didn't shoot him. That is, you didn't shoot him while I was looking at you, when there was a chance that he might have given you as good as you sent. No, you didn't shoot him then. You waited until his back was turned. You, you coward. Ferguson's lips whitened. "'You're talking extravagant, ma'am,' he said coldly. "'Something is all mixed up. "'Has someone been shooting, Ben?' She sneered, pinning him with a scornful, withering glance. "'I expected that you would deny it,' she returned. "'That would be following out your policy of deception.' He leaned forward, his eyes wide with surprise. If she had not been laboring under the excitement of the incident, she might have seen that his surprise was genuine, but she was certain that it was mere craftiness, a craftiness that she had hitherto admired, but which now awakened a fierce anger in her heart. "'When was he shot?' he questioned quietly. "'Last night,' she answered scornfully. "'Of course that is a surprise to you, too. An hour after you left,' He rode up to the cabin and fell from his horse at the edge of the porch. He had been shot twice, both times in the back. She laughed, almost hysterically. Oh, you knew enough not to take chances with him in spite of your bragging, in spite of the reputation you have of being a two-gun man. He winced under her words, his face whitening, his lips twitching, his hands clenched, that he might not lose his composure. But, in spite of the conflict that was going on within him at the moment, he managed to keep his voice quiet and even. It was admirable acting, she thought, her eyes burning with passion. Despicable, contemptible acting. I reckon I ain't the snake you think I am, ma'am, he said, looking steadily at her. But I'm admitting that maybe you got cause to think so. When I left Ben last night, I shook hands with him, after fixing up the difference we had. Well, ma'am, he went on earnestly, I'd just got through telling him about you and me figuring to get hooked up. And do you think I'd shoot him after that? Why, if I'd been wanting to shoot him, I reckon there was nothing to stop me while he was standing there. He'd never knowed what struck him. I'm telling you that I didn't know he was shot, that she made a gesture of impatience. I don't think I care to hear any more, she said. I heard the shots here on the porch. I suppose you were so far away at that time that you couldn't hear them. He writhed again under the scorn in her voice. But he spoke again earnestly. I did hear some shooting, he said, after I'd gone on a ways. But I reckoned it was Ben. What do you suppose he would be shooting at at that time of night? She demanded. Why, I don't remember that I was doing a heap of wondering at that time about it, he returned hesitatingly. Maybe I thought he was shooting at a sage hen or a prairie dog or something. I've often took a shot at something like that when I've been alone that way. He took a step toward her his whole lithe body alive and tingling with earnestness. Well, ma'am, there's a big mistake somewheres. If I could talk to Ben, I'm sure I could explain. She drew her skirts close and stepped back toward the door. There is nothing to explain now, she said coldly. Ben is doing nicely, and when he has fully recovered, you will have a chance to explain to him, if you're not afraid. Afraid? He laughed grimly. I expect, ma'am, that things look pretty bad for me. They always do when someone's trying to make them. 
I reckon there ain't any use of trying to straighten it out now. You won't listen. But I'm telling you this. When everything comes out, you'll see that I didn't shoot your brother. Of course not, sneered the girl. You did not shoot him. Stafford did not hire you to do it. You didn't come here pretending that you had been bitten by a rattler so that you might have a chance to worm yourself into my brother's favor and then shoot him. You haven't been hanging around Bear Flat all summer pretending to look for stray two-diamond cattle. You haven't been trying to make a fool of me. Her voice trembled and her lips quivered suspiciously. Well now, said Ferguson, deeply moved. I'm awful sorry you're looking at things like you are. But I wasn't thinking to try and make a fool of you. Things that I said to you, I meant. I wouldn't say things to a girl that I said to you if... She had suddenly stepped into the cabin, and as suddenly reappeared, holding the rifle that was kept always behind the door. She stood rigid on the porch, her eyes blazing through the moisture in them. You go now, she commanded hotly. I've heard enough of your lies. Get away from this cabin. If I ever see you around here again, I won't wait for Ben to shoot you. Ferguson hesitated, a deep red mounting over the scarf at his throat. Then his voice rose, tingling with regret. There ain't any use of me saying anything now, ma'am, he said. You wouldn't listen. I'm going away, of course, because you want me to. You didn't need to get that gun if you wanted to hurt me. What you said would have been enough. He bowed to her, not even looking at the rifle. I'm going now, he concluded. But I'm coming back. You'll know then whether I'm the sneak you said I was. He bowed again over the pony's mane and urged the animal around the corner of the cabin, striking the trail that led through the flat toward the Two Diamond Ranch House. End of chapter 20「Twenty One of the Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. The Promise. Ferguson heard loud talking and laughter in the bunkhouse when he passed there an hour after his departure from the Radford cabin in Bear Flat. It was near sundown, and the boys were eating supper. Ferguson smiled grimly as he rode his pony to the corral gate, dismounted, pulled off the bridle and saddle, and turned the animal into the corral. The presence of the boys at the bunkhouse meant that the wagon outfit had come in, meant that Leviatt would have come in, if he had not already done so. The stray man's movements were very deliberate. There was an absence of superfluous energy that told of intensity of thought and singleness of purpose. He shouldered the saddle with a single movement, walked with it to the lean-to, threw it upon its accustomed peg, hung the bridle from the pommel, and then turned and, for a brief time, listened to the talk and laughter that issued from the open door and windows of the bunkhouse. With a sweep of his hands, he drew his two guns from their holsters, rolled the cylinders, and examined them minutely. Then he replaced the guns, hitched at his cartridge belt, and stepped out of the door of the lean-to. In spite of his promise to Mary Radford to the effect that he would return to prove to her that he was not the man who had attempted to kill her brother, he had no hope of discovering the guilty man. His suspicions, of course, centered upon Leviatt, but he knew that, under the circumstances, Mary Radford would have to be given convincing proof. The attempted murder of her brother, following the disclosure that he had been hired by Stafford to do the deed, must have seemed to her sufficient evidence of his guilt. He did not blame her for feeling bitter toward him. She had done the only thing natural under the circumstances. He had been very close to the Garden of Happiness, just close enough to scent its promise of fulfilled joy when the gates had been violently closed in his face, to leave him standing without, contemplating the rugged path over which he must return to the old life. 
He knew that Leviatt had been the instrument that caused the gates to close. He knew that it had been he who dropped the word that had caused the finger of accusation to point to him. Stafford didn't hire you to do it, Mary Radford had said ironically. The words rang in his ears still. Who had told her that Stafford had hired him to shoot Redford? Surely not Stafford. He himself had not hinted at the reason of his presence at the Two Diamond. And there was only one other man who knew. That man was Leviatt. As he stood beside the door of the lean-to, the rage in his heart against the range boss grew more bitter, and the hues around his mouth straightened more grimly. A few minutes later, he stalked into the bunkhouse among the men who, after finishing their meal, were lounging about, their small talk filling the room. The talk died away as he entered. The men adroitly gave him room, for there was something in the expression of his eyes, in the steely, boring glances that he cast about him, that told these men, inured to danger though they were, that the stray man was in no gentle mood. He dropped a short word to the one among them that he knew best, at which they all straightened, for through the word they knew that he was looking for Leviatt. But they knew nothing of Leviatt beyond the fact that he and Tucson had not accompanied the wagon to the home ranch. They inferred that the range boss and Tucson had gone about some business connected with the cattle. Therefore, Ferguson did not stop long in the bunkhouse. Without a word, he was gone, striding rapidly towards the ranch house. They looked after him, saying nothing, but aware that his quest for Leviatt was not without significance. Five minutes later, he was in Stafford's office. The latter had been worrying about him. When Ferguson entered, the manager's manner was a trifle anxious. "'You seen anything of Radford yet?' he inquired. "'I ain't got anything on Radford,' was the short reply. His tone angered the manager. "'I ain't asking that you got anything on him,' he returned. "'But we missed more cattle yesterday, and it looks mighty suspicious.' Since we had that talk about Radford, when you told me it wasn't him doing the rustling, I've changed my mind a heap. I'm thinking he rustled them cattle last night. Ferguson looked quizzically at him. How many cattle you missing? he questioned. The Stafford banged a fist heavily down upon his desktop. We're twenty calves short on the tally, he declared. And half a dozen cows. We ain't got to the steers yet. But I'm expecting to find them short, too. Ferguson drew a deep breath. The number of cattle missing tallied exactly with the number he had seen in the basin down the river. A glint of triumph lighted his eyes, but he looked down upon Stafford, drawling. You have been doing Italian? Yes. Ferguson was now smiling grimly. Where's your range, boss? he questioned. The boys say he rode over to the river looking for strays. Sent word that he'd be in tomorrow. But I don't see what he's got to do. No, returned Ferguson. Of course. You say them cattle was rustled last night? Yes. Stafford banged his fist down with a positiveness that left no doubt of his knowledge. Well, now, observed Ferguson. And so you're certain Radford rustled them? He smiled again saturninely. I ain't saying for certain, returned Stafford, puzzled by Ferguson's manner. What I'm getting at is there ain't no one around here that'd rustle him except Radford. There ain't no other nester around here that you know of? questioned Ferguson. No, Radford's the only one. Ferguson lingered a moment. Then he walked slowly to the door. I reckon that's all, he said. Tomorrow I'm going to show you your rustler. He had stepped out of the door and was gone into the gathering dusk before Stafford could ask the question that was on the end of his tongue. End of chapter 21